Hello again everyone, it is me, Matimus. We are going back to the world of combat aviation and a beautiful fighter jet we're looking at today. We are discussing the F-4 Phantom, a highly requested aircraft on my channel for very good reason. Most of us remember it from obviously the Vietnam War era, but of course it's one of those aircrafts that a lot of people say it should still be in service, it's a fantastic jet, etc, etc. Now I always look at this jet as basically a heavy hitter. It has got a lot of punch to it, uh, a lot of capability to carry a ton of ordnance, and I would have to agree that this aircraft really does say to me Vietnam. Um, you know, you see these jets flying over as fast as they possibly can, launching a ton of napalm into a wood line full of enemies. That's how I envision seeing this aircraft in the back of my mind. But I'd like to discuss discuss a little bit more about its history and its service development to give you a bit more of an idea and an understanding as to what brought this aircraft to be, its history and what it's capable of. So let's have a quick discussion about the beautiful F4 Phantom. So every good thing must have a start and this aircraft begun in the 1950s in development with McDonnell Douglas as the F4 Phantom. It became one of the most prolific fighter aircraft of the Cold War, serving in numerous air forces around the world. The aircraft saw extensive service in a number of large regional conflicts including the Vietnam War, the Yom Kippur War and the Iran-Iraq War. The origins of the F-4 Phantom began in the 1950s. Originally the goal of the program was to increase the performance of the F-3H Demon, an aircraft already in the Navy's inventory. In 1955 the Navy requested that McDonald provide two YAH-1s as the F-4 was then referred to. From an all-weather single-seat fighter armed with cannons to an all-weather two-seater fighter armed with missiles and no cannons. I know, and this was one thing that I actually did not know about this aircraft in its initial phasing. The aircraft at this juncture became known as the designation F-4H1. Development continued through the late 1950s and the Phantom made its first flight on May 27, 1958. Soon after its first flight, the new fighter began setting records. On December 6, 1959, it set a new absolute world altitude record of 98,556 feet. Less than two years later, on December 5, 1961, it set a sustained altitude of 66,443 feet over a 25 km course. An additional record was also set in 1961, which was the world speed record set at 1,604 miles an hour on a 15 km course. While the Phantom had begun breaking records, there was some aerodynamic instability in the design that were revealed during the first flight testing. For production began, several changes were placed on the original design and were implemented on different halves of the wings to have a modified angle of degrees to each head. This basically meant that the sections of the wings were adjusted to allow for better stability. Additionally, different types of aileron were placed onto the aircraft to try and increase this. Following the modifications, the first production F-4s were some of the largest and heaviest fighter aircraft that were produced up to that time. It was just over 58 feet long from nose to tail with a wingspan of 38.5 feet and with a height of 16.5 feet. Powered by two General Electric J79 engines producing 17,000 900 pounds of thrust in afterburner. The production Phantom was capable of a maximum speed of 1,450 miles per hour. The massive amount of power made by the Phantom capable of carrying large amounts of ordnance, up to 16,000 pounds of external stores, including bombs, missiles, fuel, and potentially nuclear weapons. Production began in this aircraft in 1961 with the F-4B. Initially, only the Navy and the Marine Corps bought the Phantom. However, under pressure from the Secretary of Defense Robert McNair, there was an insisting standard that was placed across the services. The Air Force evaluated pairs of F-4s in 1962. Initially referred to the Air Force as the F-110 Spectre, or the F-110, and the first F-4Cs were delivered by the Air Force in 1963. Not long after the Air Force began to arrive in operational units, US involvement in Vietnam conflicts began dramatically escalating. After several air-to-air -air engagements, it became very quickly apparent that the F-4 had a number of problems. At the time of the Vietnam conflict, air-to-air -air missiles were still really in their infancy and frequently did not work as predicted. Studies showed that 45% of Vietnam-era AIM-7s and 37% of AIM-9s failed to either launch or lock on, and after evasive maneuvers, probably only achieving a kill of about 8% and 15% for the two types respectively. The Falcon missiles were even worse, and the Pentagon later withdrew them completely from service. 
Additionally, the MiGs that the Phantom encountered in Vietnam were very different types of aircraft. The three designs were most commonly seen over Vietnam with the MiG-17, 19 and 21. They were all developed as an interceptor aircraft. They were much lighter and far more maneuverable, particularly in the case of the MiG-17, and armed with several cannons. Consequently, the Phantom had to engage enemy aircraft at subsonic speeds, where it was at a disadvantage. Because of the failure of many missiles to lock onto their targets, let alone even hit them, as well as the nature of dogfights taking place in the skies above Vietnam, many pilots found themselves wishing that the Phantom had been equipped with a built-in gun. An interim fix came about in the form of a gun pod suspended under the belly of the aircraft. However, this was really just a temporary fix as the gun pod had no gun sight, requiring the pilot to pretty much judge his aim based on the trajectory of the traces that were coming from the gun. Eventually, when it came to designing the F4E, the beautiful 20mm General Electric Vulcan M61 cannon was included on this beautiful airframe. During the Vietnam War, the United States Air Force F4s claimed to have shot down 107 MiGs while losing 33 of their own aircraft. Navy F4s had a better kill ratio, shooting down 40 MiGs while losing 7. Additionally, Marine Corps F4 pilots claimed an additional 3 MiGs shot down, however MiGs were not the greatest threat to the American aircraft over Vietnam, with large numbers of surface-to-air missiles such as the SA-2 and a tremendous amount of AA guns, 474 F4s from all branches of the service were lost to ground fire because of this. The high loss rate to missiles and anti-aircraft fire was due to the increasing usage of the F-4 as a fighter bomber, supporting friendly troops on the ground in close air support missions and interdiction missions brought by the Phantoms down to the much lower altitudes, making them a lot more susceptible to ground fire. As a result of the experience in the Vietnam War, both the Air Force and the Navy implemented their own programs to increase pilots' capabilities and to survive a dogfight. The Navy started its Fighter Weapons School, more popularly known as, yes, Top Gun and the Air Force began incorporating the Red Flag exercise to bolster its existing weapons school. Additionally, the Air Force worked to improve its Weapons System Evaluation Program, or WSEP, to resolve the problems with its air-to-air -air missiles. In the years that followed the Vietnam War, the Phantom was upgraded several times. In the 1970s, the Air Force began to be modified to the F-4G standard in order to make them suitable for the Air Force's Wild Weasel missions. These type of aircraft were tasked with the suppression of the radar systems used by enemy anti-air systems. Over 30 years after it was designed, a number of F-4Gs took part in Operation Desert Storm in 1991, carrying out suppression for enemy air defences, known as SEED. These missions to eliminate the air defense radars in Iraq prior to the main force coming in. Five years later, the US Air Force became the last branch of the US military to retire the beautiful Phantom fighter jet. However, the Air Force continued to soldier on with the US military in a number of different roles. Worn down Phantoms were actually converted to target drones, which is kind of sad to see, blowing up Air Force. Um, but it's ironic that the air-to-air -air missiles that they were launching back in the day are now being improved enough to actually shoot them down again, so it's a little depressing, isn't it? Um, but they were expended over many different target air uh, ranges at the designation known as QF-4, or Target F-4. Over 200 F-4s were converted to target drones and continued to be operated until August 2016, when the role was finally taken over by earlier model F-16s. While the US military was the primary user of the Phantom, it is by no means the only one. Hundreds of Phantoms flew with over a dozen air forces around the world, including Australia, Egypt, Great Britain, Germany, Greece, Iran, Israel, Japan, South Korea, Spain, Turkey, all of them flew F-4s. Now I could talk about the variants of the F-4 until I am blue in the face. There are so many different configurations of this jet worldwide and it would just be too much to talk about. But despite its use as a warfighter, the airframe of the F-4 also proved very highly versatile to the point that it was also further developed as a tactical reconnaissance platform. These were designated RF. The F-4 airframe proved adept for the role of considering its speed and range. RF models also had the advantage of reconnaissance and digital navigation systems. A former F-4 pilot once noted about flying the Phantom II. He said that the engineers put wings on a brick and pretty much made it fly. This was actually my initial impression when you look over the aircraft in general. It is a gigantic beast with these big old flat wings and it just looks like it can't fly. But it certainly does and it does it very well. In subtle ways the design was quite unorthodox, but in others she proved extremely traditional. A perfect blend of smooth lines and sharp features. Wings were highly swept, low wing monoplanes positioned in the mid portion of the fuselage. The fuselage itself was streamlined and rounded, while each wing was cranked up slightly at the ends. 
intakes were present either side of the cockpit, seating area and ran length of the engine exhaust under the tail section. The two-man crew sat in tandem with the pilot in front and obviously the systems operate in the rear. The nose extended out past the cockpit and housed an extremely powerful radar system for its time. One of the most distinguishable features of the Phantom's design was the unique tail assembly containing a traditional tail fin but two horizontal panes that were actually cranked downwards. The engines exhausted under the tail section formed up into the base and basically produced a ton of heat on that tail section which initially they did have a couple of problems with but they adjusted the temperament of the materials that they placed on there and they fixed it up quite easily. In terms of armament this aircraft was primarily designed as a fleet defender or long range engagement air to air fighter. Ultimately though it grew into a multi role multi service performer. Originally armament included the AIM-7 Sparrow medium range air to air missile system. This was also augmented by the use of the short range AIM-9 Symewinder that we know of today as a new air to air missile for its day. An M61A1 20mm multi barrel rotary cannon was added to the mix and provided for close in weapon system engagement though the missile only aircraft was completely abandoned when this started coming into effect. As I said gunnery was coming back into the play. In the ground strike role the Phantom could take on a mixture of bombs, fuel tanks, missiles and rocket pods as needed. In the wild weasel air defense role the Phantom was armed with a harm anti radiation missile. The outstanding airframe could take up to the massive external ordnance that was placed onto it which really suited it well for close air support during the Vietnam era on which it for the most part carried a ton of rockets, a ton of napalm and a ton of heavy ordnance such as bomblets, cluster munitions. One centerline four wing underpod was provided along with semi recess placements for the AIM-7 Sparrows under the fuselage. But what really set this aircraft apart from others in its time period? What really made this a legacy aircraft? Well, for the most part, its production numbers, its combat history, and the fact that it was so multi-purpose. Considering it was produced in a period of relative peace for the most part, with over 5,000 examples in noteworthy existence, numbers of this weren't even achieved in the regularity in World War II at a time of global war altogether. The Phantom II followed this achievement up with a stellar combat record, in particular throughout the Vietnam conflict, going toe to toe with various MiG types which really it should not have been going against back in its time. Including both the Vietnam War and the Persian Gulf War of 1991, Phantom II crews were credited with the destruction of 280 enemy aircraft. That is a lot of jets folks that these things have knocked out. The Phantom really does in my eyes though come across as the multi-purpose use and that's really where it deserves the namesake of being such a crazy good aircraft. The Phantom 2 proved very capable for most operations between land and sea, whether it be radar suppression, enemy aircraft interception, strike targets, reconnaissance, bombing, close air support, whatever it may be, it ticked every single box. Now yes of course. It required some modifications along the way, but which aircraft doesn't nowadays? I'm sure when the F-35 comes into full blown service, we're going to see the same thing happen. To that, the capability of a pilot's systems operators and ground crews without them would never be able to have this legacy show to be in history. You know, there's a lot going in saying of the pilots, but when it comes to the aircraft itself, there's a lot of other people involved, and I would like to make a massive shout out to those who have supported this aircraft, not only in its, you know, flight, uh, refueling, rearming, but its design, its care, its maintenance, all those things that we, I guess, forget. And for those of you who have served in supporting any kind of aircraft the world, around the world, I would like to, I guess, tribute this video to you in some regard, uh, because I always talk about, you know, the fighter pilots and the combat roles, but these things would not be flying without you. So I'd like to thank you for your service and thank you for supporting aircraft around the world. So folks, that's it for today. I hope you took a little bit in about this beautiful aircraft. You know, it really does have quite the setting in terms of military aviation. If any of you have been involved with the F-4 Phantom, flew in it, rearmed it, refueled it, seen them, interacted with them, climbed all over them, let me know. I'd love to hear your opinion on this aircraft. Leave them in the comments section below. Let's have a chat. Let's talk about it. Speaking of having a chat, if you did enjoy today's video and you just want to come speak to me, please go check out my Discord channel. Uh, the link is in the description box below. Hopefully it's fixed now. I did have a couple of problems with that link. Um, if you also enjoyed today's video and you want to see more of it, click the little bell by the subscribe button. I would really ask that you do that, folks, if it's something that you want to see more of. Uh, the problem is that I think something's gone wrong with um, the, the bell button on YouTube as a platform as a whole. So click the little bell button if you could. And if you want to support my channel anymore, feel free to go check out my Patreon account. 
Uh, any support there is most appreciated, and I can't thank you enough for those of you who have been supporting me on that platform. It really, really means a lot. Thank you again for watching, folks, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.